Welcome to Conversation with Zaki Baruti, with your host Zaki Baruti. And like always, I want to give a shout out to my biological family. What's happening? Mm -hmm. To the Universal African People's Organization family, what's going on? And to New Life Evangelists and the family headed by Reverend Rice, keep up the great work. And a shout out to our cameraman, Bob. On that note, we don't have another great show because in studio with me is a uh, up and rising star in politics. Well, <laughs> she's been in politics for a number of years. And she sits on the St. Louis Board of Aldermen uh, representing the 10th Ward. And I'm speaking none other to Shamin Hubbard Clark. Welcome to Conversation with Zaki Baruti. Thank you for having me. Okay, then. Uh, as we begin our show, I would like for my audience to know a little bit about the person that I'm interviewing. Mm -hmm. So wherever in your background that you want people to know about, Shamin Hubbard Clark. I mean, Shamin <laughs> Clark, Clark Hubbard. Hubbard. Forgive <laughs> <It's> me. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, you said it best. My name is Shamin Clark Hubbard. I humbly serve as Alder Lady. I like to call myself Alder Lady. Uh, in the 10th Ward in the city of St. Louis, this is actually my second term down at the Board of Aldermen for the city of St. Louis. I was formerly the 26th Ward Alder person, um, Alder Lady for the city of St. Louis. Prior to that, I was the 26th Ward Democratic Committee woman for the city of St. Louis. Prior to that, I was a very successful business owner um, in the West End on Del Mar. I own two beauty salons. I've been a licensed cosmetologist um, by trade in Missouri for a lot of years. I won't tell my age, but a lot of years, almost 30. And um, and so I just, but I've always given back in my community, whatever community I've been in. I was born and raised in the Ville under my grandfather, Joseph Clark Sr., who was a former um, Fourth Ward Alderman. Also the first uh, black director of public safety for the city of St. Louis and director of welfare for the city of St. Louis, which is a position that we don't have anymore. He was also um, president of NAACP, not just locally, but regionally, and just did work in all over the community, all over the world that I saw. And that um, definitely sparked my desire to want to serve in the community and lead the way he did, which the greatest example he set was that everything was for the greater good. And so it was unselfish, unapologetic, um, the way he served. And so that's the way the way he served, which was the example that was set for me. And so um, I started off just giving, literally just giving back in the community. Um, in the fourth ward at Tandy, I used to do these back to school picnics. Um, back to school picnics, picnics mm -hmm, okay. At Tandy Rec Center. And it connected me, Mr. Brown, God rest his soul, um, he just recently passed last yes, year. Yes, Mr. Brown, yeah. I remember, a very he, outstanding young man. Yes, oh my goodness, and uh, so he, um, my first picnic, he, he didn't let me just come and do the picnic there. He um, connected me with so many leaders in that area first, O.L. Shelton and some of the other greats um, that were over there in that area, and it just, again, connected me in ways that I had no idea were setting me up a trajectory for um, to be able to run and be in position today, and I didn't, I don't, I didn't take a second for granted then. So you know, I'm not taking a second for granted now. And so, just watching people, I'm gonna be honest. Um, I've watched you uh, through the years and how you serve in the community, um, and the, the the examples that you set uh, for leaders, up and coming leaders like myself. Um, so I, I learn a lot. A lot, silently, I learn a lot, and I'm proud of that. I like to sit and listen. Some people say she doesn't talk enough, which is crazy, but they don't know that um, when I talk, when I need to talk, I will talk. Well, when I'm ready to right. talk, I will talk. Right. But for the most part, I like to listen and learn. Okay, then. Now, was your candidacy for the 26th mm -hmm. Ward, okay. was that your first uh, baptism into politics in terms of running for a political mm -hmm. office? No, my uh, when I ran for in 2014 for a committee woman, that was my first time. Okay. 2012. I'm sorry. So you transformed from I mean transitioned from a businesswoman into politics. Was that where was there any one particular incident or something that made you get into politics? You know, uh, I, you heard me say I started off when I was just giving back as a business right. owner, giving back in the community. What I found is that um, my first run in 2012 for a committee woman, Democratic committee woman, um, it opened up a new level of access to resources. And so my giving could be greater. And so for me, every time I wanted to elevate, it was because I could see I loved what I was doing and I loved the access and the way I was able to help people there. But if I had an opportunity to get into a space where I could help them even more, then that's what made me, um, encourage me and inspire me to go ahead and run. So 2012 was my first election. Um, for Democratic Committee Woman in the 26th Ward, and that was successful. Um, and I ran against all odds. 
And okay. in 2019, uh, for Alder person, former Alderman Frank Williamson, who I had an amazing relationship with, I would have never ran against him. Actually, he supported me when I ran and encouraged me when I ran for um, 2012 committee woman. He had resigned. And so the seat became open. And two people had actually already ran, um, well, filed to run in that race. And I ended up praying about it. I didn't really even talk to a lot of people about it. I just prayed about it. And then January 3rd or 2nd of that year of 2019, I was like, I'm going to file. I'm running. And that's what I did. Again, against all odds. And I ran a very race, a very good race, a hard race that I can be proud of, though, because it, it, it was uncompromising um, because I ran again against all odds. And I didn't really have any big support other than, um, and I'll be honest, other than uh, Congressman Clay. Okay. Now, as out of person, uh, what would you say a couple of the highlights of uh, your serving in terms of pushing legislation that mm -hmm. would benefit St. Louisans? Absolutely. Well, I'll say, um, first of all, I, I like to liken my job when I say I'm having a good day as an older person. I'm a very good secretary for the constituents of the 10th Ward, then the 26th Ward, now the 10th Ward. So um, it's way bigger than legislation. Legislation is the, is the title of the job. You're a legislator. Right. But being a good older person and being an effective and an impactful older person, you know there's way much more work to it than that. So I have successfully at my... Uh, at my race this year, I'm sorry, now we're in 2024 and 2023, I had already um, either co-sponsored, sponsored, carried, and successfully passed over 100 pieces of legislation at the board then. Now we're in our next session, our legis legislative session that we've started now. And again, I'm on the same trajectory, working and passing legislation that, again, are for the greater good. I don't work on anything that I don't believe in and I'm not proud of because I fight for everything I work for. So within that legislation then, say, uh, what, what are you really proud of as far as uh, the legislation that you pass? Just mm -hmm. a couple of pieces. But before we do that, we'll have to take a quick okay. break. I hope you're enjoying the Zakiba Rudy Show. Now we need your help to get the word out about this community affair program and so many others. Now, how do you do that? Well, you tell folks to turn to 24.2 on their television set and even family, friends, relatives that live outside of the area. Well, get them to put the NLEC TV app on their phones and look it up on their computer. 24 hours of wholesome family programming. So much community programming that you're not getting on other stations right here on NLEC TV. So please spread the word. And while you're doing that, continue to get involved in the work of the New Life Evangelistic Center. So many opportunities awaiting you and your family at this particular time. New Life Evangelistic Center is on the front lines with first responders directly helping homeless people day after day after day. Behind me are the new headquarters uh, for the New Life Evangelistic Center, along with the studios for NLEC. TV or 24.2. You may want to drop by and visit them sometime. This is where we record the Zaki Baruti program at 2428 Woodson Road in Overland, Missouri. New Life Evangelistic Center is offering homeless people so many opportunities to be set free from the cycle of homelessness, has a wide variety of safe houses, and so many women and children are staying there, and they're learning all different kinds of opera, uh, school, uh, different skills, all kinds of skills here at 2428 Woodson Road. We also have the training centers in New Bloomfield, Missouri, Marshfield, Missouri, the largest daytime walk-in facility, southwestern Missouri, northwestern Arkansas at 806 North Jefferson in Springfield, Missouri, the worldwide work of the New Life Fanjo Center in Kakata, India, and then in uh, Lagos, Nigeria, and in Haiti, all over New Life Evangelistic Center trying to help people that are in need. New Life Evangelistic Center receives no city, state, or federal dollars, and we're only able to do this as a result of the prayers and involvement of caring people like you. So please pray for this work, and please partner with the New Life Evangelistic Center so we continue to keep the Saqib Rudy Show and the other community affair programs on the air. Remember, tell everyone you know about it and go to the NLEC TV app. Welcome back to Conversation with Zaki Brood. In studio with me is all the lady, uh, Shermaine Clark Hubbard mm -hmm. of the 10th Ward. And on the other side of the break, I was asking you in terms of the many pieces of legislation that you've mm -hmm. been able to pass. Mm -hmm. 
which, which, give me two or three of them that you're really proud of. Oh my goodness. So you heard me say I did over 100. Right. So I got to break them down. Uh, and I want my constituents to know that my big legislation is just as important when I pass legislation for them to get speed humps, you know, or, or traffic stops, you know, and things of that nature, because that's a legislative process too. But I guess I'm most, some of the ones I'm most proud of is where my, um, where my profession and my policy met my passion, which was cosmetology. I passed Board Bill 222, which was the Crown Act for the city of St. Louis, which was a piece of legislation that provided a tool against um, discrimination for your hair, for how you wore your hair. Okay. And so, um, and I was proud to pass that legislation. I was also proud that it was signed into law by the first African-American female mayor of the city of St. Louis, Mayor Tashara Jones. Um, some other things I pass funding pieces. For me, it's, you know, everybody likes to talk about what they can do, but it's no money, no mission. You can talk about what you want to do, but unless you can put financing and resources behind it, that makes a difference. So I've um, carried some very heavy legislative pieces that um, increase funding or apply funding um, into programming here in the city of St. Louis that I could go on and on and on and on about. But Bill 116 was one of the heavier ones because it had guaranteed basic income in it. And if you're not basic familiar, income, guaranteed basic okay, income, in it, which was um, a very hard fight. It's no secret. I literally ran through the airport um, to get back home from a trip I was on to fight for guaranteed basic income because I had heard that one of my colleagues was going to put forth an amendment to strike it from Board Bill 116 at the time. And I got here and I fought for it and I fought for it so hard and we won. Okay. And now to this day, those um, applicants, those guaranteed basic income applicants, um, approved applicants rather have received their first $500 direct cash uh, payment. I'm proud of that. Okay. Um, so if legislation like that, again, that's impactful and sustainable and makes a difference right. um, are the ones that I'm most proud of. But again, I, I work, I take every piece of legislation I pass seriously. Civilian oversight, so I can't leave that out. Um, I passed civilian oversight twice. With my colleague, when I say I passed, I carried the legislation, but I couldn't have done anything without the Board of Aldermen, the President of Board of Aldermen, Megan Green, and the Mayor, Tashara Jones, and her administration as well. But I had to run that through twice in one legislative session, and now we're going to have to circle back and do something again. But that fight is a fight I'll take every day, because it's a 20-plus year fight, and I was proud to have a part in it. Now, on the civilian oversight, because uh, I'm a former co-chair of the Coalition Against Police Crimes and Repression yes, that sponsored it uh, yes. lot, some years back. Yes. And um, i never forget, I, uh, just, uh, I'll share this story mm -hmm. of Jamal and I and a number of other, Jamal Rogers, who yes. was uh, the co-chair along with myself. Uh, we were up in Jeff City uh, advocating for the return of the control of the police department from the state control yeah. to, you know, local control. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when you're trying to pass a bill, you get one side that's for it and the other side that's against yes. it. Our opposition was uh, Fred Wigger, who was the head of the police union. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I had testified, and Jamal, and then he had his testimony, he said he was against the bill because Zaki Baruta was for it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I, actually, that's what was stated, for real. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but Pat said, explain to the public the importance and the significance of civilian oversight. Mm -hmm. A uh, civilian oversight, like with anything. For the police department. Absolutely. And and so just so we have it for the police department as well as we um, created the space for detention oversight, um, detention center oversight, detention, detention oversight board. Okay. I might have that wrong. But facility, that's the word I was blocking. Right. Detention facility oversight board. But we can, sometimes that's where the narrative gets misconstrued and people manipulate it and use it against it. Civilian oversight is good in any space. Civilian oversight is good in our schools, in our government, of course, in our police departments, of course, in our detention facilities. When you're going into any corporation, oversight is good, right? So why is it so manipulated when it comes to the police department? I still haven't been able to answer that within myself because, again, transparency, being all of these things are good in every other space. But why people make such a big deal out of it over on the police department, I'm not sure. I have an amazing relationship with the police department, St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department, that I worked for, that I built, and that I'm proud of. One, and most importantly, because the community I serve in, because of the history of policing, the relationship sometimes is not there. And so they have to depend on me to be able to call and be able to help bridge it when it's needed 
and also work on it when it's not, you know, when there needs to be gaps filled. And if I don't have a relationship with them, then I can't be this, be in that space for them. And that's not fair to them because they pay taxes. They deserve policing like everybody else. And so um, open communication for me is a part of oversight, but making sure we have a tool, a real tool in place that provides oversight so that, hey, you're not policing, you're, you're not oversight of yourself, which we know can be manipulated. That's what I think civilian oversight in any space, why it's so important and in the in the police department as well. And and I'll be honest, when I worked on this legislation, as I keep, there were a lot of people that tried to say the police were against it. And that's just not what I found. I heard from police all the time that said that they believed in civilian oversight, that it would even help them in some ways. So um, I know that the media and everything, because it sells, they like to pit it against each other and pit it like it's something against the police, nefarious against the police. But again, like I said, we have oversight in any other space. It's OK. So why not make sure that we have it in this space as well? Now, as an extension in terms of the issue of police policing in St. Louis, uh, there had been an effort, and I understand there's a new effort that's getting ready to go forward at the Missouri State Capitol uh, having the state get back involved in mm -hmm. uh, control, some form of control of mm -hmm. uh, the police department. Your thoughts on that? I am. Uh, but before you do it, we have to have another break. Okay. As we feel the darkness pressing in upon us, both personal needs and needs in the world, society as a whole, it's easy for us to get depressed. And when we're depressed and negative and feeling hopeless, we're not going to be able to help anyone. That's why I daily have to draw strength from the Word of God. That's why I have to go on walks in the midst of the wonders of God's works. And that's why I have to be able to see something that's worked for many, many years in my life, is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That He's with us always, even to the end of the world. And that we can be a light, letting His love and power flow in us and through us in a cold, dark world. There are people hurting out there. There's people that are crying out to God at this particular moment in the midst of their desperation. Can we be led by the Holy Spirit to them? Can we believe God to reach out and let His love flow through us and by faith help them meet their needs? That's the challenges that the Lord gives us in His Word. Experience the joy of really helping somebody else and letting the light and love of Christ shine in you and through you. Today's subject, Martin Luther King Jr. He was a social activist and Baptist minister who played a key role in the American Civil Rights Movement from the mid-1950s until his assassination in 1968. King sought equality and human rights for African Americans, the economically disadvantaged, and all victims of injustice through peaceful protest. He was a driving force behind the watershed events, such as the Montgomery bus boycott and the 1963 March on Washington, which helped bring about the landmark legislation as the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. King was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964 and is remembered each year on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, a U.S. federal holiday since 1986. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., civil rights pioneer. There are so many people who work in our community uh, glorifying God with the gifts that they have, and we thank Zakid for doing that uh, regularly with us. You can make a difference, too, by partnering alongside New Life Evangelistic Center. If you're tired of seeing all of the pain and the hurting around you in your community, and you're ready to get into uh, the trenches and to work alongside a ministry that has been doing this work for so long, consider and pray helping New Life Evangelistic Center to be there when people are hurting. Zaki has, has done that for many years, and we're so thankful for that. You can be a part of the difference, too. You can be a part of the team, God's team, of working to help heal the hurts of hurting people in our community. We would love to partner alongside you. Please contact us soon to get involved with the work of New Life Evangelistic Center. Welcome back to Conversation with Zaki Baruti. In studio with me is all the latest Shameen Clark Hubbard. And on the other side of the break, we were, uh, I had made mention of the um, state, again, trying to uh, get into the city politics by controlling uh, the police department. Your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? 
I believe in local control. Okay. Bottom line, period. Bottom line. So whatever we have to do, whatever the challenges are, whatever changes we need to make to make sure that we can have everyone have it be a win win for everyone for local I'm sorry, for local control, then that's the side that I'm on. I understand that there are some reasons that there might be a group of people that want state control, but I also understand the disparity between how the state leads and how local how we lead down here on the ground because I'm on the ground every day. And I know that it won't be the same. And so I would rather work at the table and work on the side of keeping local control while also meeting some of the needs and the gaps that people think are there for us to need state control. Now, going back to your uh, ward, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, originally St. Louis City used to have 28 wards, yeah. which was cut down to 14 wards. Yes, what are your ward boundaries right quick? So uh, real quick, we did go from 28 to 14 wards due to not just um, redistricting, but war reduction that was voted overwhelmingly 10 years ago in 2012 in the city of St. Louis. It just came to fruition with the last census, so it came into election this um, or last year in 2023. So I'm the 10th ward, which has eight amazing neighborhoods, uh, White House Skinker, Skinker de Bolivar, de Bolivar Place, West End, Visitation Park, Academy Sherman Park, Lewis Place and Fountain Park neighborhoods are all in the eight of the tenth ward. There's eight neighborhoods. So my election ward, my election say was um, eight neighborhoods plus you and me equals the power of ten. Oh, okay. <laughs> then. Now, why is it important to vote? You know, we have a, a, a real some real heavy elections that's going yeah. to be taking place in 2024. Yeah. And a lot of people say say sometime uh, by voting it, it won't help me any. Or how would you counter that? So why is it important to vote? I counter this conversation all the time. Uh, I have to make it valuable to whatever person, whoever I'm in front of talking to that time. So it's been different a lot of times on what that conversation is. But the bottom line is, I want you to think overall, if you say you're not going to vote, and then you've set the example for however many people in your household that's not going to vote. It's not just your vote. Then if you have the people in your household and they say, well, Zaki don't vote, so I'm not going to vote. So then their networks don't vote. And you see, it becomes more than just one person not voting. It becomes entire communities sometimes that don't vote. This is intentional. And we know that. And we know that people will come into our communities and spread this narrative like your vote don't count and nothing is getting done so that you won't vote so that they can be on the other side getting done what they need to be done because they vote, okay? Right. So everybody's vote is valuable, important. If, I, if I'm having a conversation with a constituent, I can make it make sense to them on what I can do personally, right? Or what I can do as one vote down at the Board of Aldermen or the role that a comptroller plays or the role that the mayor plays, all these elected officials play. Um, when, I, when I break it down like that and bring it down to their doorstep, and that's the only way I have been successful in changing somebody's mind about not voting. You have some people that are just not going to vote. And you can't waste all your time with them. You can try. But on, after that, you can continue to try to work on the community around them so that they can change. And not to mention on the back end, people that come in with resources into communities, this is their voting is a number that they look at. So if you have a voting block over here that has 90 percent votes, and you have a voting block over here that 20% vote, where do you think they're going to drop their resources at? The 90%. So we have to make sure that we um, convey that and continue to convey that to our community and just make it, make it cool to vote. In 2024, what do you see as, say, the top three issues facing the city uh, for the year 2024? Uh, of course, our crime. Crime. Um, now, didn't the homicide rate drop this year? Yes, it did. Okay. Yeah, we did We did just receive that, and I actually was in a space with the chief where they said they're going to put out some additional data on that because I know there was um, some conversation about where the numbers came from. And it's not, again, people like to come up with these conspiracy theories. It's not that. It's just different ways that they um, dispense information into the community. And he said that it's going to be on the website, some more numbers, some additional numbers and data on that, which is good. Um, so crime, you crime, think, is uh -huh. one, one crime, one economic day. development, economic um, development, economic development, which is here. We're in a unprecedented time with the money and the resources we have at the table to be able to do economic development here in the city of St. Louis, most especially in the north side of the city of St. Louis, the real north side of the city of St. Louis. And um, of course, we have the ongoing issues of um, 
are unhoused here in the in our in the city of St. Louis and city services. I would lump them all together, you know, just quality of life services and making sure that they're all working properly. Okay, we'll have to take our last break. For the outcast all alone For the man without a home For that desperate heart that gives their soul away In the hope they'll be And for the sad, neglected wife, for the man life has passed by, for that rejected man who's dying all alone, for the way he lived his life. please donate you know help new life keep going because just think about it when you go buy a bag of chips instead of buying a bag of chips or a cup of coffee get someone off the street help them change their life so maybe one day they're on their own coffee company or their own chip company it's a stride but it starts as a process please continue to help new life because without new life a lot more people will not be here no. Welcome back to Conversation with Zaki Baruti. We only have a couple more minutes with uh, all the ladies, Shameen Clark Hubbard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I got it right. <laughs> uh, so on the other side, you was uh, uh, sharing what you see as the three major issues. Also, there's a group um, that is uh, saying that there's too many charter schools, which include the Teachers Union and some other uh, Jeff Van Alu area mm -hmm. uh, activists. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on charter schools and uh, the proliferation of them? Do you think? What's your thoughts? Yeah, well, I'll start by saying I really don't have any thoughts because I'm a proud St. Louis public school parent. Um, my kids have been in St. Louis public schools for their entire tenure. I was actually raised, both my parents worked for St. Louis public schools. So I've been around St. Louis public schools all my life. I went to trade school at the time. Um, my parents made a choice for us to do the DSEG program, so I've seen both sides of it. And I still believe 100% um, in St. Louis public schools. So that's always the side I'm fighting on. Whatever side is most effective and impactful for them, for the people that are in that district that work hard every day, every day, unapologetically and uncompromisingly against the things that they have to deal with in that district. Okay, then now for anybody that from the 10th Ward that may be uh, listening or mm -hmm. in general from uh, the community want to get in contact with you, how would they get in contact with you? All of my constituents have always had my cell phone number. It's been on everything I put out. So my cell phone number, 314-393-1393. I can be reached on social media, Shameen Clark Hubbard. Um, on Instagram and Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter is SC Hubbard 10. Now, do you also, as an older person, have public meetings or public forums to yes. inform your uh, uh, constituents of yes. what's taking place? Absolutely. I do attend all of the meetings that happen in the ward um, monthly, but I do also hold a space that I call the one-on-one -on -one with the older person. I move it around the ward once a month. This month is going to be at 100 Black Men, and I'm proud of this one. It's going to be called The Role We Play. And it's going to make sure that people know how they can advocate properly for themselves and not be misguided um, by misdirected blame that keeps people distracted. I know that's right. Um, we only got about a minute left. Mm -hmm. If What would be your message to our people going forward into 2024? Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. I know that um, people will tell you it is not worth it. It doesn't work. Ain't nobody doing nothing. I promise you people are doing stuff. And the more we get people engaged um, and keep them engaged and they'll see and they'll be able to spread the narrative too. You can't go by headlines. You can't go by what you might just see. You have to do it yourself. Get in there yourself and see the work that's being done and see the people that's really for you so that you're not misled by the people that's not. 
I know that's right. Well, look here. I really appreciate you sitting Thank in the chair with conversation me. with Zaki Baruti. And like always to uh, my uh, listeners, get involved. Make sure you vote in every election, yeah. but also know the issues as well as join a progressive organization that speaks truth to power. We say join the Universal African People's Organization. On that note, may God bless each and every one of you.